to take a little aside, I thought appropriate, two things that are being remembered today. Number one, the death of our Lord Jesus Christ as we observe the Lord's Supper. And also, this Easter Sunday traditionally celebrated by men uh, that uh, regarding the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I trust that, uh, that uh, many of you, not just on this particular day, and I know that's not the case with those that I see in this congregation, but that many, uh, they show up two times a year for church, and that's at Christmas and Easter. Uh, I had a pastor one time that said, well, this is Easter Sunday, so I'm going to go ahead and say Merry Christmas to you because that's the next time I will see you. Uh, I'm not going to do that because I trust that I will, that you will be worshiping, if not here in your uh, local churches. Uh, I know that... Uh, uh, my brother Tim and Dina, that they, I don't have to say that to them because they will, you know, and others of you also. But we are thankful uh, that we do celebrate both of these in reality every Sunday. Both the death and both the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to speak upon a passage of scripture this morning that I think really glorifies and magnifies the truth of both of those events. And so I want us to read this morning from Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39, and speak on the hope and assurance of the believer, the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you would please stand as we read these verses of Scripture. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. May God bless his word this morning. You may be seated. So I've already noted upon this day we're remembering basically and speaking upon two separate events. And I believe them to be the two greatest events in human history so far. Amen. There is one great event left. <laughs> and no man knows the hour or the day when that will be. But the, these two events, we do know the hour, the day, the time when these events occurred, and I do believe them to be facts. I do not believe them to be fables created by society or by tradition. Now, if you listen to uh, much of media today, if you listen to much of intellectualism today, you will find many that will disparage both the death of Christ and his coming as the perfect Son of God, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But let me say this, these two events are truly the hope and the assurance for every past, present, and future believer in Him. We have a hope. We have an assurance, as the Apostle Paul makes clear in this particular chapter of the Word of God, as we're going to look at some of this as we go through this. But there are 
other places that Paul speaks of this. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and 8, Paul speaks of the hope of salvation. In Titus 1 and 2, he speaks of the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before the world began. And of course, we see that promise and that plan there in verses 28 through 30 of this particular chapter. Also in Ephesians chapter 1, you will see that God had a plan. And that plan included the death of Christ and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in Hebrews 6 and 11, the writer says there, speaks of the full assurance of hope unto the end. We have a full assurance of hope unto the end because of these two events. And it's all centered upon the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see in this particular passage of Scripture, particularly in verse 34, where both of these events are named Christ Jesus dying and Christ Jesus being raised. We see in this the hope and the assurance of the believer. So let's go back to verse 31 here. What then shall we say to these things? Now what things is Paul speaking of? Now some suppose, and I don't know that it's a wrong interpretation, that they would say, well he's speaking of what he's just said in verses 28 through 30, and there would be really nothing wrong with that. But I believe that there is more than just those three verses in view here. At the very least, I think it is likely that he is speaking of what has preceded these verses in verses 1 through 30. But I also believe that he is, could be speaking and maybe even likely speaking of all of the great truths that he has revealed in the book of Romans up until this point. Now, it's not been that long ago, not been that many years ago that I preached through this great book. And it was a joy and, and a privilege for me to do that. It's one of the great pleasures of my life to be able to preach through the book of Romans and then also through the book of Hebrews and now through the book of John. But there in Romans, one of the great truths that is revealed early on in the scriptures is where the Apostle Paul declares in verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is stands written, the righteous shall live by faith. Another great truth that is seen is in chapter 5 of Romans. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What a great truth that that is. In chapter 6, and in there in verses 5 and 6, the Apostle Paul declares, For if we have been united with Him in a death like His, we shall certainly, man, I love that, we shall certainly, be united with Him in a resurrection like His. Here's the importance of the resurrection in that we shall be united in a like resurrection. We shall be raised from the graves as He was raised from the grave. And in verse 6, we know that our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we know would no longer be enslaved with sin. What a great truth that is. And then we get to chapter 8. And the Apostle Paul, in that great first verse of Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore now, 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 no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In verse 11, the scripture speaks there of if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Verses 16 and 17. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then what? Heirs. Heirs of God. Fellow heirs with Christ. 
provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified together with him. And then, of course, I cannot omit verses 28 through 30. Reading this, and we know. What? We guess? We think maybe? No. We know. We know that for those who love God, all things, Not some things, not most things, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom He predestined, He also called. And those whom He called, He also justified. And those whom He justified, He also glorified. I think it is these things, all of the cumulative truths that He has spoken of, it is these things. What can we say? to these things well he is asking the question what shall we say Well, these truths I hope this morning before you even got here that these truths have already captivated your minds they have motivated you to holiness in your life and that day by day they more and more enthrall you And rejoice your heart. So if God is for us, who can be against us, he says. See, this is what Paul has demonstrated, particularly here in chapter 8. Is that God is for us. Think about that. God is for us. Think about that. The God who created the universe... The God who created all things. The God who is sovereign. The God who is holy. The God who is omnipotent. The God with whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. He is for us. If you're his child this morning, he is for you. Why should we be shaken in our faith? Why should we doubt if we have this knowledge that God is for us? He is for those who are the called, for those who are indwelled by the Holy Spirit. And he says here, as he says, he is for us, but this one, he He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. You see, the hope and the assurance we have is first based here upon God giving his son for the purpose of our salvation. Every time we come to this table, we are to remember that God Gave his son. He did not spare his only begotten son. His only beloved son for our salvation. It was for the purpose of Christ becoming our sin sacrifice. And dying in our place. You see we talked a little bit and touched a little bit about the law this morning. Now the law, as the scripture says, I believe it's in Romans 7 and 12, it speaks of the law as holy and just and good. But if you go on in that, what does Paul say? But I'm, a, I'm sold under sin, therefore salvation cannot come by the law. Salvation could not be accomplished by the law. The law, there's nothing wrong with the law. We need to know the law. <laughs> We've been doing those catechisms that Brother Chris puts in our prayer uh, sheet that he gives us every day. We need to understand the law of God because the law is a reflection of the character and the person of who God is. It reveals to us His holiness. It also reveals to us we can't keep it. The law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, Paul said. So, and we see this, and in earlier chapters, in Romans chapter 3, of course, what does Paul talk about in regards to to our character? In verses 9 through 20, and I won't read 
any of that. But this kind of touches on some of what that Brother Elijah touched on this morning, that the Jews and Gentiles, there's no difference in the eyes of God as far as your sinfulness. If anything, you Jews, you're more responsible because you've received the law. You've had a reflection. You've had a statement of the character of God there. But he ends up writing, there is none righteous, no, not one. And he says, goes on down there in the last two verses, we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God for by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So here we have the plan of God. We've seen it there in Romans 8, 28 through 30. People talk about the plan of salvation. There it is. The plan of salvation, I believe, is Romans 8, 28 through 30. That's God's plan of salvation. That is His plan that He had even before the foundation of the world. And so the answer for our hope as far as, if we look at Romans 3, you see that looks hopeless, does it not? But the answer for our hope is found also in Romans chapter 3, just a little farther down. And there in verses 23 through 25, Paul writes, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. And there's a lot to dig into there. It would take a long time to dig and flesh all of that out. But there is the hope. There is the assurance that Christ's righteousness is imputed to us through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. God the Father put Him forward. When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, it cast all of us into sin. Every last one of us. And apart from the plan of God, we would be hopelessly lost. But you see, God the Father, in order that we might be saved, out of His great love wherewith He loved us, did not spare His only Son. Do you remember the story, I, I hope you do, of Abraham and Isaac? Isaac, the child of promise. And Abraham and Sarah rejoiced in that child. But one day, God says to Abraham, He says, I want you to go sacrifice your only son. And so, the son is carrying the wood. I won't go into all of that, but he's going along. And I believe that Isaac was... Not just some little boy, but I believe that he was probably a strapping young teenage young man. And he says to the father, he says to Abraham, he says, well, here's the wood. Where's the sacrifice? You know what Abraham said? God will provide himself a lamb. And guess what? He already had from before the foundation of the world, the Lamb of God slain from before the foundation of the world was the Lamb that God the Father, out of love for sinners, out of love for His people, He was willing to give up His only Son because His, own, his Son, His sinless Son, was the only way of salvation. No one born from this race could satisfy God could satisfy the righteous demands of the law. God so loved the world that He gave what His only begotten Son. In Romans 5, and there in verse 8, Paul writes this, but God shows His love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God the Father gave His Son 
God's holiness required a payment for sin. And he gave up. He did not spare his only son with whom he had had eternal, intimate, beloved fellowship with. I cannot imagine what that was like. I cannot imagine what it would be like to give up your only child in such a way. I'm thankful that I've never been asked to do that. But God did this. God gave up His only Son. And Paul goes on to us to to say that if God did not spare His own Son, if he if He gave Him up for us, will He not also with Him graciously give us all things? I think in some of the translations it says freely. But the graciously is more It is more literal. It is more appropriate in this. Because the word there is speaking in the form of the word charis, which is grace. He graciously will give us all things. And again, back to the question and the statement. If God was willing to give up his own son for the purpose of making sinners right before him, will he withhold anything from us that the son died to procure? And the Father has promised to give. And the answer to that is no. He will freely and graciously give us all things because He's already given us the one thing most precious to Him in all and that is His Son. So do you think that the God who gave His Son is going to withhold any good thing from you? I hear sometimes about people questioning the goodness and the love of God. All we have to do is to look at the love of God in giving His only begotten Son. And He's given us the most precious thing to Him, the most precious person, His Son. Yes, He will freely give us all things. And I think about the promises that have been made to us. I think about over in John chapter 10 in that great chapter of the shepherd and the sheep. And and, and Jesus is speaking here. He says, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep and I have other sheep that are not of this fold, I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock One shepherd, for this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. And you go a little farther down, and here he speaks even in a grander, in grander terms. If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Wrong verse. I skipped down. Maybe I need glasses. Verses 27, let me go back up to that. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. This is the promise. This is the giving. The eternal life, the drawing, there shall be one fold and one shepherd. That's the promise that he has given to us. And if he has given up his son just as surely as he has given up his son and his son has died upon the cross of Calvary and his son has been risen from the dead and is interceding at the right hand of the throne of God just as sure of all of that, Yes, all of these promises, all of these things He has said to us will come to pass. Woo! Man, does that not make you happy? (laughs) Joyous, rejoicing this morning? Eternal life has been promised and procured. It is finished. It is completed, Jesus said, upon the cross. We as, as he said, Paul writes here in 8 and 16 and 17, we are joint heirs with Christ. 
We are His. We belong to Him. We are heirs with Him. God the Father has promised to us in Romans 8 and 30 glorification. You notice there it's in the past tense. In the mind of God, it is already so. Yes, He will freely give us all things. And He says, Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Hmm. Who is going to call to account? That's what the word means, to call to account. To call to account, to bring an accusation against any of these. The call, the elect, the us all, whatever you want to call those that believe in Christ who are spoken of in this particular passage. They're the same people. God the Father, based upon the shed blood of the Son whom He gave freely and lovingly, has Himself justified declared us righteous as we talked about this morning in the Sunday school in a legal sense we have been declared righteous before the bar the justice seat of God for all of eternity all of eternity this is what happened look at verse 30 Past tense, already done in the mind of God. So there is no charge, there is no accusation that all of the world and all of the forces of hell can bring against us that will change our righteous status before God. Nothing. You see, I'm going to kind of skip ahead here. As he talks about down here in verse 34, he has died, but more than that, he's been raised, and he's at the right hand of God who is indeed interceding for us. You see, there's Jesus. He's been raised from the dead. He's been raised from the dead, but he's not just Waiting around, sitting around, doing nothing in heaven. No, he is there interceding for the children of God at the, at, the, at the bar, as I've said, at the seat of God's justice. And if there were to be an accuser, you know what Jesus would say? That one's mine. That one's mine. That one's mine. Righteous. 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 Why? Because we wear the righteousness. We are clothed in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. There He ever lives to make intercession for us. I think of that song, And Can It Be? And a phrase in that, no condemnation, now I dread. There is no condemnation. There is no accusation. There is no charge that can be brought against us. Number one, because Jesus Christ, for all of those that have believed in Him by faith, all of us, all of those, He has put his blood on our account. Jesus can stand even before God the Father and say, there's the scars, there's the scars in my hand, there's the scar in my side, there are the scars in my feet from which the blood flowed and paid for that one's sin and that one's sin and that one's sin and that one's sin. It is based not only upon his death, but again upon his resurrection. If you look at Romans 4 and 25, what Paul writes there, who was delivered up for our trans trespasses. Excuse me, verse 24, 25. But for ours also we counted to us who believe in Him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Again, 
Not only is the death of Christ related to our justification, but so is the resurrection. The Son who shed His blood so that we might be justified is now at the right hand of God living eternally, constantly, without interruption to make this intercession for us that we spoke of. It's written in Hebrews 7 and 25. And before the throne of God, He declares that we are righteous, that we are justified. I I couldn't help but think of the words that we sing in that song, before before the throne of God above. And so I wasn't going to depend on it from memory to read it. But the last verse of that song says this, Behold Him there, the risen Lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness. The great unchangeable I am, the king of glory and of grace. One in himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my God. We stand With eternal life, we stand righteous. We stand justified. Christ died in our place. He is risen for our justification. The risen Son of God. And He is an ever-present and ever-living intercessor for us. We can know, we can believe that the Christ who died in our place is interceding for us. That when we cry out to Him with those burdens that are too hard to bear, when we cry out, when we are going through the valley of the shadow of death, we can fear no evil for Thou, my intercessor, the one who died in my place, whoever lives to make intercession for me, hears my prayers, and He will give grace in the time of need. And He has already given me His grace that will carry me through all the way to heaven. Grace, grace, marvelous grace, grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured for me. For me. That justifies me. That that declares me righteous. Not in and of myself. But in Him. In Him. Then you look again at the concluding verses of this chapter. And Paul, it's almost like a great crescendo. I, I, I can't imagine what Paul was feeling as he was writing this. I know how I feel preaching it. But I cannot imagine as, as the Holy Spirit imparted these great truths to him. What must Paul have been saying? And it's like he's being lifted up in this great crescendo of truth. And let me say something. You need to spend some time on the mountain peaks of God's Word. I mean, you need to spend time in all of God's Word. But there are some places, and if you go through, if you hadn't read the book of Romans in a while, I'm saying this to myself, we need to all, we should read through it to remind us of the great truths. Have you ever driven through a great mountain range and you, and you go across one mountain and you say, man, this is beautiful. And you go across the next one's beautiful and the next one's beautiful and the next one's beautiful. You go through the book of Romans and there, and there are so many beautiful peaks of God's truth and grand, the grandeur is so magnificent and then you, you don't think you can see any more and then you get to Romans 8. And it seems like you're at the top. And he says here, who's going to separate us from the love of Christ? Is the tribulation, the distress, the persecution of this world, the famine, 
the nakedness, the danger, the swords of this world. Is that going to separate us from the love of God? He says here, your sake we are being killed all the day long. We're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. That's what the world thinks of true Christianity and has thought of true Christianity and still thinks of true Christianity. If you think that Christians are not being slaughtered and dying and in famine today, you're just kidding yourself. We're just insulated from it here in the United States of America. It's still happening. But the people are giving their lives willingly and lovingly for the cause and the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who laid down his life for them and he is interceding for them. And they are not being separated by His love. And in many facts of the matter, the times that I I hear these testimonies over and over again, and I, I think of those back during the time when the Word of God and the persecution of the church were so great, and, and, and the, it just seemed that the love of God flowed from the very lips of those persecuted, even in the times of the greatest persecution. kill one Christian and you just raise up a thousand more that speak the name of Christ and speak the truth of Christ what does he say here no we will never be separated from his love but in all of these things where the world is trying to destroy the church Satan is doing his best through the world and through his minions to destroy the church and destroy the gospel, Paul says, we are conquerors. We are victors. God gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. For I am sure, I am certain that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. How can we know that? Christ Jesus our Lord died for us. He shed His blood for us. He has secured our salvation. Our salvation is secure and certain because of what Christ did and the declaration of the Father that we are justified but also because Jesus Christ, we don't don't worship a dead Savior, we worship a living Savior. And He is there at the right hand of God and He is interceding for David Weber this morning. And He is interceding over here for Billy and Chrissy and for the Krugs and for the Hudmans, and for all of those, I don't want to discriminate, that are here, that know Him this morning. He is there in this very moment interceding for us. What a marvelous truth to rejoice in this morning. What a re- Isn't it? Reassuring, I I think about, you you see the chaos that this world is going through. We've gone through this pandemic and all of these people, oh, they seem like this is hopeless. You know why it's hopeless to them? Because for them, this is their hope. This life is their hope. But our hope is not built upon this world, but our hope is built on Jesus' blood and righteousness that is what it is built upon us I hope and I pray this morning that you have hope that you have the assurance of eternal life in the Lord Jesus Christ and are rejoicing in Him this morning may we pray